How's it going, Dopamon fans? The 2022 NHL Draft is over, so if you haven't already, go check out my scouting reports on the top Russian skaters that were drafted and the draft recap that we have on the channel. But what's this list in front of me? The 2023 NHL Entry Draft is now less than a year away, and I thought it would be fun to start my mock drafts way too early with a list of the top 50 prospects. So, first on the list... Connor Bedard, a center for the Regina Pats in the WHL, we all saw his four goals against Austria at the World Juniors, we all saw him lead Canada's U18s team uh, in points, but he also led the WHL in goals per game and scored more points on a weaker team than top prospect from the 2022 draft, Matthew Savoy. Uh, he's a genera uh, generational talent, and he's going to go first overall. Second up... We have Adam Fantilli. Another big performance at the U18s overshadows two incredible underage seasons in the USHL. Uh, he's committed to the University of Michigan next season, being born in 2004, so we'll really get to see his game fully exposed as he competes against a much higher level of competition. Number 3. WWMMD, what would Matvey Michkov do? The best puck handler in the draft, you know him for pulling off the Michigan goal multiple times. He is small, and it does limit how he produces offense compared to a guy like Connor Bedard, who is also small. But also, I feel like because he bounces between the pro and junior leagues a lot, he just needs to find a little bit more chemistry, a little bit more consistency, and then we'll see him demonstrate a little bit more of his skills. Uh, he's also signed to the KHL until 2026. That's a full three years after the draft. And with the Russia question kind of looming, I have to put him third. Number four, Dalibor Dvorsky. I'm happy to flat out say I think Dvorsky is better than 2022 top prospect, uh, Buri Slavkovsky, also from Slovakia. You can hate on me all you want, but uh, when they played together at Halinka, it was obvious that Dvorsky was better, despite being over a year younger. Dvorsky has his speed, the sense, the skill, uh, all to be a top center in the NHL one day, and he's already shown that he can handle pro-level hockey in the Swedish Allsvenskan League. I really like what's coming out of the WHL this year, and after Bedard, I have Jaeger. He's got that star quality when he carries the puck that makes him a threat every time he's on the ice. He was the, uh, the WHL Rookie of the Year this year after Bedard was last year. I could see him maybe falling a little bit if scouts see him maybe as more of a winger than a center, but I think that the skills and the potential are all, are all there for him. So at 6, I have Leo Carlson. It was really hard for me to have Carlson drop out of the top 5, especially behind Dvorsky, as they play in the same Swedish J20 league where Carlson has the statistical edge. He has scored more in that J20 league than Dvorsky has, and is already playing regular bottom 6 minutes in the SHL. But his greatest strength is also his greatest weakness. His 6 foot 3 frame lets him dominate against his peers at the junior level, but he still has a lot of work to do to become a top center at the NHL level rather than just kind of like a bottom six kind of body. Now number seven, Callum Ritchie. Not related to the Richies in the NHL right now, and Callum is really the opposite. He's skinny and a bit lanky, but he's a smooth skater with lots of offensive zone creativity. In his OHL numbers alone, he scored more points than some of the top 2022 prospects in the OHL, like Hunter Height and Paul Ludwinski, so look out for him to have an incredible breakout season next year. So at 8, I have Charlie Strammel, the second NCAA player after Adam Fentilli. Strammel is a true power forward and really knows how to use a 6 foot 3, 215 pound frame at both ends of the ice, which has kind of earned him the nickname Big Rig. Uh, he really impressed me on the third line playing center with Rutger McGrordy at the U18s this year, and I have a feeling that he's going to transition really well to the NCAA next year. 
At nine, I have Casper Holtinen. Uh, Holtinen's a hard one for me to really uh, rank. As of right now, he's a little bit of a one-dimensional scorer, but I think that there's a lot of potential in him. First, uh, he's one of the younger top prospects in the draft, so I feel like he really just needs more time to figure out his game and to show it off. And second, he's six foot three already and filled into his body. He knows how to play a very physical game. He already shined at the U18s as one of the better offensive talents for Finland and he's still just, you know, a year out from his draft. So I think if he figures out the rest of his game, I can see him being a top 10 pick in this year's draft. At number 10, I have my first defenseman on the list, Mikhail Gulyayev. I've had the opportunity to watch a lot of him while watching Gleb Trikozov for the 2022 draft or on the same Omsky team, and he continued to grow and impress me throughout the year. He's got amazing puck control in tight areas and engages uh, opposing skaters physically uh, in all three zones. He's a modern, all-round, complete defenseman, and that's why he's the top defenseman in this year's draft for me. At 11, I have Zach Benson. I might be too low on Benson. For a few skaters above him on my list, I have them there because I see the potential in them, but as far as judging who's the best right now, Benson should be higher. His Winnipeg Ice team is really good with top prospects like Jack Finley, Carson Lambos, Matthew Savoy, and Connor Geeky on the roster, but in the playoffs this year, Benson really took the mantle and stepped up for his team and generated a lot of offense himself. If he can kind of carry that progress into next season, he'll definitely compete for a top 10 pick for me. At number 12, I have Riley Height. Height's a fast skating, playmaking center that's been a bright star on a really poor Prince George Cougars team. He's sort of been forced to be their number one center now. Uh, they're really an awful team, and I think it's making it harder to see Height as a top 10 pick. I want to compare that to who I have at number 11, Zach Benson, in the same league but on a much better team. We get to see Benson play in situations beneficial for his scoring, while for height, he's kind of forced into situations that are just really above his level of experience as a minus one a draft pick. I think it's good for height's long-term development, but really bad for his draft stock, so uh, I'm, still gonna, I'm still gonna be really high on him. At 13, I have Edward Sale. Uh, he really made his mark for me with a five-point game against Canada at the U18s, catching lots of wind on that top line for Czechia, and he's absolutely torn it up for the in the Czechia U20 league, and he's gotten some time in the pro league as well. I definitely see him as being like the next big Czech forward prospect, even better than the 2022 top Czech prospect uh, Yuri Kulik would be. At number 14, I have the second defenseman on my list, and a very different one. Uh, Theo Lindstein has already got a lot of experience at the pro level, scoring one assist in 12 games in the SHL with Brynäs, but that's basically the limit of his offense right now, even at the J20 level in 34 games he only had 4 assists. I love defensive defensemen, but historically even the best tend to fall in the draft, so unless uh, Lindstein here develops his offensive game a little bit more, I can see him dropping by the end of the season. At 15, I have Lukas Dragashevich, second defenseman in a row. Uh, Dragashevich is a guy that I definitely wouldn't have had on my list if not for his performance at the U18s. His Tri-City Americans team is pretty awful, and as a defenseman, it's really hard to look good on a losing team, but watching him play, he's got good size and skill and can really move the puck pretty well. I want to see him take another uh, step and kind of score like crazy next year, maybe help pull his team out of their slump. Uh, for now, I have him at 15. So for my third D in a row at 16, I have Tanner Mullendyke. He's a defenseman for the Saskatoon Blades. The Blades are another team that are pretty mediocre, but for them, I think it's really due to their lack of scoring. So for a defenseman like Mullendyke, it means that his stats won't immediately stand out as a first round pick, but he's a great skater that reads the game well, and I think the potential's there. At 17, I have the Slovakian winger, Alex Czernik. He's the second Slovakian that I have on my list after Dalibor Dvorsky, and they both happen to play in Sweden. At the Division 1A of the U18s this year, Czernik actually played with Dvorsky on the same line, and I think that they really complemented each other very well. 
Dvorsky being that smart, reliable center, with Chernik driving a lot of explosive offense for their line. Though, just from watching their play in Sweden, it's clear that Dvorsky has that edge and potential to be a top center in the NHL, while Chernik is just really good offensively. So at 18, I have Nate Danielson, a center for the Brandon Wheat Kings in the WHL. He is one of the oldest players in the draft, and probably the least flashy. Danielson has just a lot of skill that he doesn't use enough, and that will determine next year just how high in the draft he goes. I see a solid middle six center option for him in the NHL, but there's also some risk reward there where if he doesn't learn how to use all of his skills, maybe he's lower, but if he does figure it all out, I can see him really going up in the draft. At 19, I have defenseman Hunter Berzustvitz. Uh, I believe he's the first American that I've seen in this draft that elected to play in Canada, at least the, the top prospect that has. Being born in 2004, he had elected to play for the University of Michigan, but decommitted and will start next season with the Kitchener Rangers. And I think... This, was, this here was the right move for him. Playing for Michigan, he would have seen much less ice time, stuck behind prospects like Luke Hughes, Jacob Truscott, Steve Holtz, Ethan Edwards, Seamus Casey, Luca Fantilli, Brendan Miles. There's just too much talent in Michigan, so not only would his draft stock drop, but more importantly, he'd be missing out on some serious ice time and key development. Uh, Berzustvitz is, uh, he really improved in the second half of the season, and after seeing him play at the U18s, I can see why he'd rather compete for top minutes in Kitchener than barely play in Michigan. At number 20, I have my first goaltender, who I may be pronouncing wrong, Michael Rabel. Uh, he plays in Czechia. He's the first one I have on my list, and for a really, really, really big reason. He's six foot six and already killing it in the Czech U20 league. He's committed to the University of Massachusetts for the 25-26 season, so he'll be developing for at least three years, but that's pretty normal for goaltenders. And as a goalie, I can see him maybe dropping, but because of his size, I think there's serious potential for him to have a really good season, impress some scouts, and maybe go in the first round. At 21, I have defenseman Artu Karki, who's only the second player I have coming out of Finland so far. I didn't think Karki stood out too much at the U18s, but I also think that he didn't get the opportunity to maybe showcase all of his elite offensive zone skills on a much more defensive Finnish team at the U18s. Uh, he really found his game at the U20 level in the Finnish league already, so when he does get some ice time in the Liga next season at the Pro League against men, it'll either make or break him, and we'll be able to better see his full game on display and determine if he's a first-round pick or maybe a third or fourth-round pick. At number 22... I have Matthew Wood, who led the BCHL in points this year, simply exceptional and on par with other BCHL players in their draft one, uh, draft minus one years like Kent Johnson and Alex Newhook, but the level of competition in the BCHL is much lower than the WHL, where the Regina Pats own his rights. So before I move him into my top 20, I want to see him either play in the WHL or at the BCHL level just be more than an elite scorer. So at 23, I have Cameron Allen, the right shot D from the Guelph Storm in the OHL. He's already my favorite prospect in the draft, and he's the reason that I'm wearing my Guelph Storm jersey. I've had the opportunity to watch him live a bunch in Guelph, and he already plays like a draft-eligible player. He's 5'11", but he plays like he's 6'3". He's physical, he's skilled and confident with the puck, aware in all three zones. He's already one of the best defensemen on his team, and I see him as like a guaranteed second-pair do-everything defenseman in the NHL one day. For the next two picks, I'm going to release them at the same time, and I'll explain why. I have Oliver Moore and Will Smith. So with Charlie Strammel, who I have ranked 8th overall, committed to the University of Wisconsin next year, that leaves Moore and Smith as the top two centers for the U.S. National Team Development Program. I have them ranked back-to-back -back because it's really on either of them to take that number one center spot and be better than the other. 
Uh, more, he's an incredibly gifted puck carrier with the dual threat of being able to, mo you know, both make plays and score goals. He's a little bit smaller, but he hasn't, you know, he hasn't shown his full game yet. And I think that, you know, next year he has that opportunity. And then Will Smith, yeah, he's another gifted puck carrier, much like Moore, but one that likes to, you know, carry the puck more, uses skill to deke and, you know, take shots a little bit closer rather than just making, you know, longer shots and longer passes. So we'll see between them. I really, really like them both, but I have them back to back now. At 26, I have defenseman from the Portland Winterhawks, Luca Cagnoni. Uh, Cagnoni might be one of the best skaters in the draft, not just in raw speed, but in his edge work, agility, acceleration. I've seen a lot of comparisons to Kale McCarr just in like that raw physicality when skating. There's definitely some work that needs to be, you know, uh, worked on to, uh, in his overall game to kind of reach McCarr's level, but that offensive upside is definitely there. At 27, I have another defenseman, Maxim Sturback. The right shot D playing for Jokeri is the third Slovakian I have on my list and another that doesn't play in Slovakia. Unlike Dvorsky and Czernik, Sturback plays in Finland for Jokeri's U20 team. Uh, but since Jokeri, uh, their pro team, they used to be in the KHL and now they won't be playing. They've left due to the, the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. They won't be playing in the Liga again until the 23-24 season. So unless Sturback elects to play somewhere else, then I believe he won't have an opportunity to play in a pro men's league. On, until much later, which may drop his draft stock a little bit. Uh, he really impressed me at the Division 1A of the UA teams, so we'll see what happens. At 28, I have Quinton Musty. Uh, Musty was one of the few bright spots on a very weak Sudbury Wolves team. He's strong, knows how to use his body, and has great skills 1v1 against defenders, a big shot. Still has a long ways to go, but he has all the foundations of an NHL player. He also has, in my opinion, both the best and worst name in the draft, Quinton Musty. And so at 29, I have Dominic Peter, the center, uh, the third prospect I have from Czechia, the second skater, and the, the first one that doesn't play in a Czech league. Uh, he plays in Finland for Luko in the U20s, uh, might get some opportunity in Liga next year. He didn't really impress me a lot at the U18s, but I definitely think there's some potential there. He's tall and has lots of offensive skills, but he just lacks a skating skill and physicality to compete and score consistently, even at the Finnish U20 league, so I don't know, you know, when he plays against men if he's going to be able to compete. If he builds some strength and that uh, translates to his skating, I think he'll stay around this spot by the end of the year, but if not, I have him dropping maybe to the, th uh, to the third or fourth round. At 30, I have the Swedish center Otto Stenberg. Stenberg's season stats indicate that he probably should have been ranked higher, but I think some of those stats come from him being on a much higher scoring team in Forlunda. Not that he wasn't good in his own right, he's incredibly skilled as a puck carrier, he scored a few Michigan, uh, Michigan goals, the lacrosse style goals already, and he just projects to be a center at the NHL level as well. At the U18s though, this year he just wasn't able to show off the skills like he could at the U20 league, and I feel like that just means he has a lot more growing to do to become a more complete player and really show off, and then he can be higher up on the list. At 31, I have Jaden Perron, a winger who's Canadian but playing for the Chicago Steel in the USHL. The Chicago Steel pump out prospects, and it's not by accident. They have a great hockey program, and if players are willing to put in the hard work and pay attention to all the details, it'll pay off. And that's exactly how Perron's uh, minus one season went. He's a smaller winger, but that hasn't stopped him from being one of the hardest workers on the ice and growing as the season progressed. He did play on the same line as Adam Fantilli a few times, and while definitely not as, go, uh, as good as him, he shows lots of promise and ability to maybe be a top six piece one day. At 32, I have Samuel Honzek. He's a center and the first Slovakian on my list that actually played in Slovakia this year, though Honzek was actually drafted by the Vancouver Giants in the CHL import draft, so he'll have the option to come over and play in his draft year if he so chooses. For him, 
I don't know if it's the best option or not. He's getting good minutes in the Slovakian Pro League, but there's also room in Vancouver's top six if he decides to come over, and it may help him transition to the North American style quicker if he does. As a bigger skater, he's got a little bit of an awkward stride, but he's still fast and physical. I can definitely see him dropping a bit if he stays overseas. You know, he might get more looks in Canada, but at the same time, I can also see him dropping if he just doesn't adjust well in the WHL here in Canada. So, we'll see. And that does close out the first round for me, and I wanted to save this particular player for the first pick in the second, because I have no idea how much Russian and Belarusian players are going to fall in the draft. I have Ivan Anoshko, the center. Uh, right now, I have Anoshko pretty high. Uh, everybody remembers in 2021 when Vancouver shocked everybody by selecting Daniela Klimovich in the second round. Uh, Anoshko has already kind of looked like he's going to be better than Kl uh, Klimovich. He scored at the top Belarusian league where Klimovich uh, hadn't yet. And, you know, beginning next season, Belarus is actually going to be getting a junior team in the Russian Junior League, the MHL. So Anoshko is going to have the chance to play and develop against much better talent in the Russian system, as opposed to playing in the Belarusian system, which is kind of weak, doesn't get as much attention. It's also going to uh, raise his draft stock. As someone that scouts the Russian leagues, I can't wait to watch him as well and make a scouting report, as I've done for the other top skaters in the Russian Russian system the past two years. At 34, I have Austrian defenseman David Reinbacher, who's playing in Switzerland. Uh, Reinbacher's a guy that I accidentally found while looking for Austrian prospects in the 2022 draft. Marco Kasper, Vincenz Rohrer, and Luca Auer, all forwards, were guys that I was watching, and I had spent much of that time also watching Reinbacher thinking he was draft eligible. The best look I got was at the World Juniors in December, uh, which were cancelled. Even in Austria's 11-2 loss to Canada, Reinbacher looked alright. He got an assist. He was only a minus one. I'll be really tracking his development this year, but for now, I just want to project him as a potential, you know, early second round pick. At 35, I have Daniel Butt. Yes, his name is Butt. Stop giggling, because at six foot four, he isn't a guy you want to laugh at. I've had the opportunity to watch him a lot this season, as I do scout the Russian leagues, and Loko Yaroslav's team is probably my favorite in Russia. He has a lot of skills, but and he's also very developed physically in both upper and lower bodies. He's a great skater. He's strong. He's physical. He's got all he's got all the raw tools of an NHL player. But sometimes he just looks kind of lost on the ice. So I think with some development, you know, coaching from a really good team, he could absolutely be an NHL player one day. So at 36 overall, I have Andrew Crystal. Crystal is a highlight reel package of puck skills. A former lacrosse player himself, he's even scored a lacrosse-style go uh, Michigan goal in the WHL. Being one of the better offensive players in this draft, I can definitely see him rising to a top, uh, top 10 spot if he gets even better, but if he doesn't explode offensively, then the flaws in his game uh, away from the puck will cause him to drop in the draft. At 37, I have my second goaltender on the list, Scott Ratzlaff. Uh, he's a guy that thrived as the backup on a really good Seattle Thunderbirds team, and I think he showed a lot of consistency even as a backup, never giving up more than four goals in a game. I know he Sometimes got the easy end on some of the back-to-back-to-backs in the WHL, but his record of 17-2-1 in his first full WHL season just puts him into the second round for me. At 38, I have Cohen Zimmer. Uh, Zimmer's a guy, he plays on the wing with Riley Height, who I have ranked at 12th overall, on the Prince George Cougars. Again, Prince George is a really bad team, with Height and Zimmer leading in points as their number one and two forwards. They're their top line, those two guys. Both of these skaters can really only get better from this point on, so I'm high on both. But Zimmer, being more of a goal-scoring winger, has had a little bit of an easier time looking better on a bad team than Riley Height has. So maybe he does drop a little bit. I mean, I don't know, but uh, 
I have him here at 38. At 39, I have Callan Lind, the younger brother of Seattle Kraken prospect Cole Lind. And it looks like Callan might be a bit better. At least at his point production at this point in their careers, Callan does look maybe a little bit better. He's physical and aggressive. He does get easily distracted, kind of loses positioning, you know, tunnel vision and all that. But I think if he refines his game, he could be a first round pick and definitely a scary NHLer one day. And at 40, I have another younger brother of an NHL player, this time Emil Yarventi, who's the brother of Ottawa Senators prospect Roby Yarventi. Uh, being 5'10", Emil doesn't have the size as his 6'3 older brother, but he might have more skill. He's fast with and without the puck, and he has a killer goal-scoring instinct. At 41, I have somebody I might take a little bit of flack for having uh, being low on, Gavin Brindley the winger. Uh, he is very skilled, he has got an incredible motor on him, but he just lacks the foot speed expected of a smaller skater, and despite you know his best efforts, he just lacks the physicality to compete in the dirty areas. I don't mind smaller players, especially when they're forwards, but when they don't have the strengths to comp you know, compensate for their smaller size, I always question their NHL potential and projection, so I have him just a little bit lower. Even at the U18s, I think he was overshadowed by his line mates, uh, Frank Nazar and Isaac Howard that he played with, as really more of a complementary energy piece than a guy that drives offense by himself. I know he's a year younger than both of them, but even in, you know, at the U18s last year, I thought, you know, even Howard was a little bit better. At 42, I might be playing favorites as a fan of the Guelph Storm, but I think there's some serious hidden potential in Valentin Zugin. Uh, he's had an impressive MHL uh, season in his minus two year, and I think that his stats in his minus one year weren't as good because he was stuck playing bottom six minutes on a really deep Guelph Storm team. In contrast, where we see guys like Riley Height and Cohen Zimmer being the top players for their Prince George Cougars team in their minus one year, Zugin has to play behind top prospects Sasha Pastuzov and Jake Carabella on the left wing in Guelph, so he's stuck in that third line kind of role. This might drop his draft stock, but as a goal scorer, the talent is there. At 43, I have Tyler Peddle, the first prospect I have out of the QMJHL, and one who definitely has the potential to jump much higher. Peddle is the best pure goal scorer in the Q this year, but the rest of his game can be kind of mediocre tunnel vision, losing positioning, lack of focus on anything except the puck, if he can round out his game, you know, the mental side of it a little bit more, and be more than just a one-dimensional offensive guy, he'll definitely slide into the first round. At 44, I have the defenseman out of Kelowna, Caden Price. I feel like Price is the, the Kelowna Rockets team that he plays for. They don't get enough hype, especially around the draft, but they've produced two top draft prospects in the past two years, in Colton Dock and Pavel Novak, and now the spotlight is going to be on Caden Price this season as the two top D on his team have been aged out, which is going to make him their new number one D. He is a well-rounded guy, but playing as a team's number one D will either make or break him, so expect him to either rise a lot or drop a lot from this draft spot pretty early in the season. At 45, I have Calum Parker. Another defenseman in the WHL out of the Victoria Royals. Uh, he's another player that suffers from playing on a terrible WHL team, but his numbers don't show just how much he's improved and grown. And not just in a hockey sense, but physically. He went from being 5'7 last year to 6 feet tall now, and he's really grown into his body well. He's one of the tougher skaters in, in the draft, in the league. He's been willing to fight at the WHL level in the juniors. Uh, he didn't really wow me at the U18s this year, but that's okay for a defenseman, especially one that I see to maybe, you know, have to have a, a big growing season here. And uh, really, it's the potential in him that I see rather than how good he is right now. 
At 46, I have Ryan Leonard, who might be one of the best pure goal scorers in the draft. From anywhere and everywhere, he gets the puck past the goalies, the goalies' worst nightmare. But other than that, the rest of his game is kind of just meh. He does have a full year with the U.S. National Team Development Program left before his commitment to his hometown Boston College. So there's a lot of time and roster space, you know, a lot of space there for him to play and improve his game uh, and uh, maybe, you know, reach up into that first round. At 47, I have Ethan Gauthier, who came to the QMJHL as a center, but I see him as a better fit on the wing. He's a smaller skater, but he's physical and good at winning puck battles, especially along the boards, and plays a very attentive two-way game. He's got decent puck skills, but nothing too elite, so I think of him as just a very, very safe pick, and that's why he's my second pick out of the queue. At 48, I have my fifth and final Slovakian on my top 50, Andre Molnar. Molnar impressed me at the Division 1A of the U18s this year, where he was the final piece on the left wing of that second line with Dalibor Dvorsky and Alex Chernik. Uh, playing for Slovakia internationally. While he doesn't lead offensively, he looked really good as a complementary piece internationally in that competition, and uh, in the top pro Slovakian league, he's transitioned really well to playing, you know, that complementary role in a bottom six uh, position. So I think he's definitely worthy of being mentioned and um, sliding in here at the end of my list. At 49, I have out of Finland winger Thomas Urinen. Urinen didn't impress me with his offense at the U18s, but I really liked his all-round game. He's uh, got a lot of energy, he's willing to get a stick and puck into the dirty areas, especially along the boards, but just lacks that goal scoring and you know elite offensive instinct in the offensive zone. Uh, there's definitely a lot of skill to work from, though you know he's definitely more of like a perimeter guy as a winger in the offensive zone, so I just I kind of liked his role at the U18s you know, as a bottom six energy winger, and that's just where I see him, you know, projecting in the NHL as well as a bottom six just kind of energy guy. Finally, at 50, I have goaltender Trey Augustine. Augustine had the rare opportunity of being an underage starting goaltender at the U18s, and for the U.S. National Team Development Program, looks to be their future starting goaltender for the next few years. So he's not just going to be getting a lot of attention from scouts, but within the organization, which will just be good for his development overall. I think he's a guy that uh, teams are really going to want just simply because of that. He's going to be, you know, U.S.'s number one goaltender for a few years, and, uh, you know, just that, that'll be a good thing for his development. And uh, he also really impressed me at the U18s this year, just given his age. So I wanted to make him the last player on my list. And that ends my list at 50. I don't want to get too deep into the draft just yet, so I'll be saving the top 75 or 100 for October when we do another, uh, you know, early season mock draft. Ryan and I will probably do that. I might continue on and do more prospects. We'll see. Thank you so much for everyone that watched along. Uh, if you got to this point in the video, again, don't forget to check out my scouting reports for top prospects drafted in the 2022 draft. I can't wait to make more scouting reports for some of the top guys on this list as well. Of course, we're Dopamon, my best friend and I talk hockey news, analysis, predictions, rosters and live streams of international competitions. We got playoff coverage, trade news and speculation. And while this video kind of effectively ends our coverage of the 2022 NHL entry draft. It begins our exciting next chapter of providing mock drafts and scouting reports for the 2023 NHL entry draft. And was something that we love. We love the draft. We're super excited about it. So leave a like, comment down below your thoughts on the 2023 draft, and subscribe to stick around for more dope hockey content. Peace.